Two Treatises of Civil Government by John Locke. Book One, Chapter Eleven. Who Heir? Part One. The great question which in all ages has disturbed mankind, and brought on them the greatest part of those mischiefs which have ruined cities, depopulated countries, and disordered the peace of the world, has been not whether there be power in the world, nor whence it came, but who should have it. The settling of this point being of no smaller moment than the security of princes, and the peace and welfare of their estates and kingdoms, a reformer of politics, one would think, should lay this sure and be very clear in it. For if this remain disputable, all the rest will be to very little purpose, and the skill used in dressing up power with all the splendour and temptation absoluteness can add to it, without showing who has a right to have it, will serve only to give a greater edge to man's natural ambition, which of itself is but too keen. What can this do but set men on the more eagerly to scramble, and so lay a sure and lasting foundation of endless contention and disorder, instead of that peace and tranquillity which is the business of government and the end of human society. This designation of the person our author is more than ordinary obliged to take care of, because he, affirming that the assignment of civil power is by divine institution, hath made the conveyance as well as the power itself sacred so that no consideration, no act or art of man, can divert it from that person to whom, by this divine right, it is assigned. No necessity or contrivance can substitute another person in his room, for if the assignment of civil power be by divine institution, and Adam's heir be he to whom it is thus assigned, as in the foregoing chapter our author tells us, it would be as much sacrilege for any one to be king who was not Adam's heir, as it would have been amongst the Jews for any one to have been priest who had not been of Aaron's posterity, for not only the priesthood in general being by divine institution, but the assignment of it to the sole line and posterity of Aaron made it impossible to be enjoyed or exercised by any one but those persons who were the offspring of Aaron, whose succession therefore was carefully observed, and by that the persons who had a right to the priesthood certainly known. Let us see, then, what care our author has taken to make us know who is this heir, who by divine institution has a right to be king over all men. The first account of him we meet with is, page 12, in these words. This subjection of children, being the fountain of all regal authority, by the ordination of God himself, it follows that civil power, not only in general, is by divine institution, but even the assignment of it specifically to the eldest parents. Matters of such consequence as this is should be in plain words, as little liable as might be to doubt or equivocation, and, I think, if language be capable of expressing anything distinctly and clearly, that of kindred, and the several degrees of nearness of blood, is one. It were therefore to be wished that our author had used a little more intelligible expressions here, that we might have better known who it is to whom the assignment of civil power is made by divine institution, or at least would have told us what he meant by eldest parents. For I believe if land had been assigned or granted to him and the eldest parents of his family, he would have thought it had needed an interpreter, and it would scarce have been known to whom next it belonged. In propriety of speech, and certainly propriety of speech is necessary in a discourse of this nature, eldest parents signifies either the eldest men and women that have had children, or those who have longest had issue. And then our author's assertion will be that those fathers and mothers who have been longest in the world, or longest fruitful, have, by divine institution, a right to civil power. If there be any absurdity in this, our author must answer for it, and if his meaning be different from my explication, he is to be blamed that he would not speak it plainly. This, I am sure, parents cannot signify heirs male, nor eldest parents an infant child, who yet may sometimes be the true heir, if there can be but one. And we are hereby still as much at a loss who civil power belongs to, notwithstanding this assignment by divine institution, as if there had been no such assignment at all, or our author had said nothing of it. 
this of eldest parents leaving us more in the dark who by divine institution has a right to civil power than those who never heard anything at all of heir or descent of which our author is so full and though the chief matter of his writing be to teach obedience to those who have a right to it which he tells us is conveyed by descent yet who those are to whom this right by descent belongs he leaves like the philosopher's stone in politics out of the reach of any one to discover from his writings this obscurity cannot be imputed to want of language in so great a master of style as sir robert is when he is resolved with himself what he would say and therefore i feel finding how hard it would be to settle rules of descent by divine institution and how little it would be to his purpose or conduce to the clearing and establishing the titles of princes if such rules of descent were settled he chose rather to content himself with doubtful and general terms which might make no ill sound in men's ears who were willing to be pleased with them rather than offer any clear rules of descent of this fatherhood of adam by which men's consciences might be satisfied to whom it descended and know the persons who had a right to regal power and with it to their obedience how else is it possible that laying so much stress as he does upon descent and adam's heir next heir true heir he should never tell us what heir means nor the way to know who the next or true heir is this i do not remember he does anywhere expressly handle but where it comes in his way very warily and doubtfully touches though it be so necessary that without it all discourses of government and obedience upon his principles would be to no purpose and fatherly power never so well made out will be of no use to anybody hence he tells us observations two four four that not only the constitution of power in general but the limitation of it to one kind i e monarchy and the determination of it to the individual person and line of adam are all three ordinances of god neither eve nor her children could either limit adam's power or join others with him and what was given unto adam was given in his person to his posterity here again our author informs us that the divine ordinance hath limited the descent of adam's monarchical power to whom to adam's line and posterity says our author a notable limitation a limitation to all mankind for if our author can find any one amongst mankind that is not of the line and posterity of adam he may perhaps tell him who this next heir of adam is but for us i despair how this limitation of adam's empire to his line and posterity will help us to find out one heir this limitation indeed of our author will save those the labour who would look for him amongst the race of brutes if any such there were but will very little contribute to the discovery of one next heir amongst men though it make a short and easy determination of the question about the descent of adam's regal power by telling us that the line and posterity of adam is to have it that is in plain english any one may have it since there is no person living that hath not the title of being of the line and posterity of adam and while it keeps there it keeps within our author's limitation by god's ordinance indeed page nineteen he tells us that such heirs are not only lords of their own children but of their brethren whereby and by the words following which we shall consider anon he seems to insinuate that the eldest son is heir but he nowhere that I know says it in direct words, but by the instances of Cain and Jacob that there follow, we may allow this to be so far his opinion concerning heirs, that where there are diverse children, the eldest son has the right to be heir. That primogeniture cannot give any title to paternal power we have already showed. That a father may have a natural right to some kind of power over his children is easily granted, but that an elder brother has so over his brethren remains to be proved god or nature has not anywhere that i know placed such jurisdiction in the first-born nor can reason find any such natural superiority amongst brethren the law of moses gave a double portion of the goods and possessions to the eldest but we find not anywhere that naturally or by god's institution superiority or dominion belonged to him 
and the instances there brought by our author are but slender proofs of a right to civil power and dominion in the firstborn, and do rather show the contrary. His words are in the foresighted place, and therefore we find God told Cain of his brother Abel, His desire shall be subject unto thee, and thou shalt rule over him. To which I answer, 1. These words of God to Cain are by many interpreters with great reason understood in a quite different sense than what our author uses them in. 2. Whatever was meant by them, it could not be that Cain as elder had a natural dominion over Abel, for the words are conditional, if thou dost well, and so personal to Cain, and whatever was signified by them did depend on his carriage and not follow his birthright and therefore could by no means be an establishment of dominion in the firstborn in general. For before this, Abel had his distinct territories by right of private dominion, as our author himself confesses, observations 210, which he could not have had to the prejudice of the heir's title, if by divine institution Cain as heir were to inherit all his father's dominion. 3. If this were intended by God as the charter of primogeniture, and the grant of dominion to elder brothers in general as such, by right of inheritance, we might expect that it should have included all his brethren, for we may well suppose Adam, from whom the world was to be peopled, had by this time that these were grown up to be men, more sons than these two. Whereas Abel himself is not so much as named, and the words in the original can scarce with any good construction be applied to him. 4. It is too much to build a doctrine of so mighty consequence upon so doubtful and obscure a place of scripture, which may be well, nay better, understood in a quite different sense, and so can be but an ill proof, being as doubtful as the thing to be proved by it, especially when there is nothing else in scripture or reason to be found that favours or supports it. It follows, page 19, accordingly when Jacob bought his brother's birthright, Isaac blessed him thus, Be lord over thy brethren, and let the sons of thy mother bow before thee. Another instance, I take it, brought by our author to evince dominion due to birthright, and an admirable one it is, for it must be no ordinary way of reasoning, in a man that is pleading for the natural power of kings, and against all compact, to bring for proof of it an example where his own account of it founds all the right upon compact, and settles empire in the younger brother, unless buying and selling be no compact, for he tells us when Jacob bought his brother's birthright. But, passing by that, let us consider the history itself, with what use our author makes of it, and we shall find these following mistakes about it. 1. That our author reports this as if Isaac had given Jacob this blessing immediately upon his purchasing the birthright, for he says, When Jacob bought, Isaac blessed him, which is plainly otherwise in the scripture, for it appears that there was a distance of time between, and if we will take the story in the order it lies, it must be no small distance, all Isaac's sojourning in Gerar and transactions with Abimelech, Genesis 26, coming between. Rebekah being then beautiful and consequently young, but Isaac, when he blessed Jacob, was old and decrepit. And Esau also complains of Jacob, Genesis 27-36, that two times he had supplanted him. He took away my birthright, says he, and behold, now he hath taken away my blessing. Words that I think signify distance of time and difference of action. 2. Another mistake of our author's is that he supposes Isaac gave Jacob the blessing and bid him be lord over his brethren because he had the birthright. For our author brings this example to prove that he that has the birthright has thereby a right to be lord over his brethren. But it is also manifest by the text that Isaac had no consideration of Jacob's having bought the birthright, for when he blessed him he considered him not as Jacob but took him for Esau. Nor did Esau understand any such connection between birthright and the blessing, for he says, He hath supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright, and behold, now he hath taken away my blessing. 
whereas had the blessing which was to be lord over his brethren belonged to the birthright, Esau could not have complained of this second as a cheat, Jacob having got nothing but what Esau had sold him when he sold him his birthright. So that it is plain, dominion, if these words signify it, was not understood to belong to the birthright. And that in those days of the patriarchs, dominion was not understood to be the right of the heir, but only a greater proportion of goods, is plain from Genesis 21.10. For Sarah, taking Isaac to be heir, says, Cast out this bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son. Whereby could be meant nothing but that he should not have a pretense to an equal share of his father's estate after his death but should have his portion presently, and be gone. Accordingly we read, Genesis 25, 5 and 6, that Abraham gave all that he had unto Isaac, but unto the sons of the concubines which Abraham had, Abraham gave gifts, and sent them away from Isaac his son, while he yet lived. That is, Abraham, having given portions to all his other sons, and sent them away, that which he had reserved, being the greatest part of his substance, Isaac as heir possessed after his death. But by being heir he had no right to be lord over his brethren. For if he had, why should Sarah endeavour to rob him of one of his subjects, or lessen the number of his slaves, by desiring to have Ishmael sent away? Thus, as under the law the privilege of birthright was nothing but a double portion, so we see that before Moses, in the patriarch's time, from whence our author pretends to take his model, there was no knowledge, no thought, that birthright gave rule or empire, paternal or kingly authority to any one over his brethren. If this be not plain enough in the story of Isaac and Ishmael, he that will look into 1 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 12, may there read these words. Reuben was the firstborn, but forasmuch as he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given unto the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel, and the genealogy is not to be reckoned after the birthright, for Judah prevailed above his brethren, and of him came the chief ruler, but the birthright was Joseph's. What this birthright was, Jacob blessing Joseph, Genesis chapter 48 verse 22, telleth us in these words, Moreover I have given thee one portion above thy brethren, which I took out of the hand of the Amorite with my sword and with my bow. Whereby it is not only plain that the birthright was nothing but a double portion, but the text in Chronicles is express against our author's doctrine, and shows that dominion was no part of the birthright, for it tells us that Joseph had the birthright, but Judah the dominion. One would think our author were very fond of the very name of birthright, when he brings this instance of Jacob and Esau, to prove that dominion belongs to the heir over his brethren. 1. Because it will be but an ill example to prove that dominion by God's ordination belonged to the eldest son, because Jacob the youngest here had it, let him come by it how he would. For if it prove anything, it can only prove against our author that the assignment of dominion to the eldest is not by divine institution, which would then be unalterable. For if, by the law of God or nature, absolute power and empire belongs to the eldest son and his heirs, so that they are supreme monarchs and all the rest of their brethren slaves, our author gives us reason to doubt whether the eldest son has a power to part with it, to the prejudice of his posterity, since he tells us, Observations 158, that in grants and gifts that have their original from God or nature, no inferior power of man can limit or make any law of prescription against them. 2. Because this place, Genesis chapter 27, verse 29, brought by our author, concerns not at all the dominion of one brother over the other, nor the subjection of Esau to Jacob. For it is plain in the history that Esau was never subject to Jacob, but lived apart in Mount Seir, where he found a distinct people and government, and was himself prince over them, as much as Jacob was in his own family. This text, if considered, can never be understood of Esau himself, or the personal dominion of Jacob over him, for the words brethren and sons of thy mother 
could not be used literally by Isaac, who knew Jacob had only one brother, and these words are so far from being true in a literal sense, or establishing any dominion in Jacob over Esau, that in the story we find quite the contrary. For, Genesis 32, Jacob several times calls Esau Lord and himself his servant. And, Genesis 33, he bowed himself seven times to the ground to Esau. Whether Esau then were a subject and vassal, nay, as our author tells us, all subjects are slaves, to Jacob, and Jacob his sovereign prince by birthright, I leave the reader to judge, and to believe, if he can, that these words of Isaac, Be lord over thy brethren, and let thy mother's sons bow down to thee, confirmed Jacob in a sovereignty over Esau upon the account of the birthright he had got from him. He that reads the story of Jacob and Esau will find there was never any jurisdiction or authority that either of them had over the other after their father's death. They lived with the friendship and equality of brethren, neither lord, neither slave to his brother, but independent each of other, were both heads of their distinct families, where they received no laws from one another, but lived separately, and were the roots out of which sprang two distinct people under two distinct governments. This blessing then of Isaac, whereon our author would build the dominion of the elder brother, signifies no more but what Rebekah had been told from God, Genesis 25 verse 23, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels, and the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. And so Jacob blessed Judah, Genesis 49, and gave him the scepter and dominion, from whence our author might have argued as well that jurisdiction and dominion belongs to the third son over his brethren, as well as from this blessing of Isaac that it belonged to Jacob. Both these places contain only predictions of what should long after happen to their posterities, and not any declaration of the right of inheritance to dominion in either. And thus we have our author's two great and only arguments to prove that heirs are lords over their brethren. One, because God tells Cain, Genesis 4, that however sin might set upon him, he ought or might be master of it, for the most learned interpreters understood the words of sin, and not of Abel, and give so strong reasons for it, that nothing can convincingly be inferred from so doubtful a text to our author's purpose. Two, because in this of Genesis 27, Isaac foretells that the Israelites, the posterity of Jacob, should have dominion over the Edomites, the posterity of Esau. Therefore, says our author, heirs are lords of their brethren." I leave any one to judge of the conclusion. End of chapter 11, part 1